We're continuing with our 4C conference, and our second speaker will be Vladimir Gorbanov, senior sound engineer from the Wargaming Leicester Studio. Please welcome. Hi, everyone. Thanks you for coming. I'm Vladimir Gorbanov. I'm senior sound engineer of the Leicester Studio of Wargaming, and today we'll be talking about the sound design and mixing of the audio content based on the example of World of Warships. Something about me, who I am. I'm a professional sound producer, musician, and composer with a lot of experience in the industry. I've been working starting from the Alpha on World of Warships. And uh, since two years, I'm the lead sound producer and responsible for a lot of the sounds you'll hear in our project. Sound and world of worships. Talking about the sound, we should first define the world of worships in the context of the worldwide development. What makes it stand out from all other games? World of worships, this is a unique ship gameplay. It has never been done before, and the quality we provide. Calibers, maps are very smart, are really nicely done. The main caliber with uh, of uh, 460 or 480 millimeters is huge and never been done before. This is a unique product in the industry. This has its pros and cons because many systems in sound design and in other development had to be developed from scratch because we couldn't find any high quality alternatives and the genre of epic sea battles were have not been done before so we were the first in the genre. The sound of water has a huge role in a sea battle. All other games have their combat on land, and not on sea. Most of the combat, at least. Before um, I'll be coming to the specific moments, we have to define the targets, what we have to achieve in the world of worships. First, our team decided that the three challenges have to be solved. The sound has to create the atmosphere, it has to be authentic, and it has to be informative. Creating the atmosphere means that you must be able to the player must be able to immerse himself herself into the game. Auth authentic sounds means that the player has to trust it, has to believe it all you've done for him using the sound. And informative, this is the feedback from the game to the player. So the player must be able to respond to the sounds or to receive confirmations from the sound he hears. Next, we think that our sound in the gameplay of the World of Worships has to have a blockbuster cinema quality. It has to be a unique sound experience as well. This has to be very action-packed and always epic. The scenes and gameplay are all also matter because the scenes in the gameplay they create sound events like a ship collisions, like shells incoming, shell tracking, explosions where we do not only mix some sounds together but we create a scene. Like, a huge explosion makes the player do not hear anything for a couple of seconds. Then 
hear all the effects from the explosion, which can occur in real life as well when something explodes near you, and so on. Coming to sound design. World of Warships is a unique game. I have already mentioned that it is a unique product in the game industry because we have non-standard sounds, a lot of them, including sounds no one actually heard before, like the major caliber of the Yamato vessel. Taking into account the history, we won't find anything, any recording of a shot fired from the major caliber of the Yamato vessel. The players will be writing you, we know something is wrong here. The major caliber does not sound like that. And after we received those replies, we started analyzing where do they receive this experience from? How do they know a major caliber should sound in another way? We found out that the, these are the video games which define the major caliber. The TV, blockbusters, movies. And the player does not want to hear the authentic sound, actually. He wants to hear the cliché, the sound cliché he has from the movies. Like, a shot should be should sound, uh, should have a large echo, should be uh, very loud. Although in reality, if you've been uh, and you heard a real shot, a real explosion, it is a very dry sound, a dry sound attack, and that's it. So, so it's not possible to actually implement the real sounds in the, in the game industry. No one would like it. What were the key solutions, the takeaways after our discussion how we developed the sound design? First, we use the experience, the sound experience of the players. Players want a loud bangs. We did a loud bangs for them. But it was not the end, because we created additional cliches as well. The raw sounds in the game, which had never been used in the games before. A, a, a torpedo hit. This sound has never, what well, was never heard by anyone actually because no survivors were, which can tell us how it sounds like when a ship is, is hit by a torpedo. So we were the, well, the game changers here because we set here the rules. How should it sound? This was like in the Star Wars, the blaster shots. They sound like this, but physically, if we think about it, no pew pew sound would ever be heard. Simple shots or sparks should be flying, but we have this cliche in mind set by the makers of the Star Wars. And this is quite natural to us that a blaster laser gun should sound like this. All other movies which were shot after the Star Wars and where blasters are used, they should have been following this cliché and they were following this cliché as well. Our main concept is a balance between the spectacularity and the realistic feeling, the realistic sounds. We follow the sound experience of our players and we augment this sound experience. This differs drastically from the situation where we simply mix together different sounds. Next, our actual sound design concept. Our game is an online game. 
So the players spend a lot of time there. Many hours. This is how long a session can last. So every sound design should be noise free, should be free from resonances, from disturbing sounds. Like broader sounds should be <coughs> made should be made more narrow. <coughs> we also we, we also prioritize the sound when it's being played together with other sound. Controlling the volume. Making the overall mix more clear. The sounds are more site specific. This allows us to clean up the whole sound experience. Multi channel and binaural sources are also used, which is uh, mostly true for ambient sound. When we use true ambient sources, we immerse the player more into the natural atmosphere. The player trusts your sound design more when you're using ambient. He trusts your wind. He believes in the water you draw using sound, and so on and so on. But where workshops is a unique project again, and there are sounds who, wh wh which cannot be even recorded, and it cannot be found in sound libraries, of course. So we start being creative and using other ways of recording and creating sounds. Incoming shell sound will be the topping here. This is the inco shell incoming sound. According to our theory, it has to include wind sounds and has to have phase d d distortions as well. Because the sound, we, we hear direct and reflected sound, they are combined using interference and the flatter effect is coming to life. The sounds I found in silent libraries were not appropriate for that. And then I stumbled upon a simple whistle. This is one of the most popular audio editors you've seen on the screen. And I just cut out this whistling frequency manually. And this sounds like this. You don't hear the whistle, but you hear the air. This is what we're aiming at. Next, talking about the sounds no one ever heard. So the torpedo hit. I did not have a single idea how I can compose this. And then I turned to my own sound experience. We had a large water tank, uh, and as a, as, as a child, I hit against it with, with, with my feet, and it made this awkward water-shaking sound. And then I thought, a vessel is, well, basically a tank. It is a metal tank, and the physics of the sound should be quite the same. So I just made a... A, uh, took a sound of a metal bending uh, and a, a low frequency added to it uh, was like this. You couldn't hear it that well, but I think you understood the concept. We set the cliches by this and we define that this is the sound which will be denoting a torpedo hit. So the player understands that what has been done. Next, 
coming to the gameplay mixing. What is the difference between a classic mixing, the traditional mixing, like the post-production, the music production, and so on, and the gameplay mixing? When mixing traditionally, classically, you have to achieve a volume balance, you have to create a panorama, so spreading the sound sources evenly across the panorama. This is a frequency processing engineer and creative processing, uh, solving frequency conflict, filtering, filtering equalization, cropping all the unneeded frequencies. This is a dynamic processing work with the dynamics of the mix. S and s specific tracks and in the master boss as well. And the time-space processing. This is the positioning of the sources in the 3D environment. Is it close? Is it far? And so on. This is a traditional classic mixing. However, we have the gameplay. So what makes it differ? <coughs> The most important thing which makes the gameplay mixing stand out that is that we don't have fixed linear time. The gameplay depends soul-handedly on the player. What he makes, this defines the game, the soundscape. In music, we know what will happen uh, at the particular time, minute or second, but uh, nothing like that in the gameplay. So that's uh, why uh, there are different other things related to it. The mixing and sound design should be intertwined, because in real mixing, uh, everything uh, is uh, co compacted in uh, the music, and no one can differentiate between a single uh, object. But uh, in uh, the sound design, we can see that in the, in the solo, solo mode, there's uh, one object, and uh, there are sound uh, slides uh, that uh, the user has, uh, and uh, some uh, poor sound design uh, could be at the foreground as a result. So when uh, mixing a gameplay, it is uh, very impo important to engineer correct logic of uh, the sound uh, design. So mixing gameplay is not only manipulating with the faders, but it is dynamic, low, uh, correct uh, frequency. It is designing the correct uh, logic inside uh, the sound engine, and uh, it is uh, related uh, to tuning the mixing. and. Uh, positioning the low pass and the high pass uh, accordingly and uh, based on that uh, to develop uh, the sounding concept. And uh, our idea is also to create the self-regulating sound mix. No matter what the user can do, the mix uh, should be adequate and it should meet the requirements uh, that we have set for it. The last but uh, not the least uh, mixing of the gameplay is a teamwork with the, the developer, with the programmer, because the uh, audio of the video games, it's not uh, purely the work of the sound engineer. It is the interaction of uh, the game code with uh, the sound engine. So I subdivide mixing into two parts. Technical mixing, it is uh, addressing some kind of uh, frequency, dynamic uh, challenges. It is working, handling this space. And uh, creative mixing, when uh, we address uh, certain creative tasks. So, to demonstrate it, uh, let me tell you about the technical mixing. Let, uh, let us show the video of the gameplay.
so. The short uh, fragment uh, of the video makes it clear that uh, the, one of the features of the game is uh, the abundance uh, of the sound, the objects uh, per unit of the game time. So how could we deal with that? It is uh, limiting all the voice uh, at the subgroups and uh, per unit of the time and uh, prioritizing all the sounds. So simultaneously we can have uh, explosions, uh, anti-artillery guns, we could strafing of the aircraft and the uh, approach of the torpedoes, there might be voice uh, overs and uh, another warship uh, can approach uh, with the uh, large caliber guns, uh, air defense uh, weapons, etc. And it is necessary to limit the uh, sound sources. And uh, a helping hand is given by the side chain. It is uh, the chain that uh, we have a controlling and uh, control signal, and uh, the volume of one controls the other. So we do not only control the volume over here, we can uh, control and automate all the parameters that are available in the sound engine uh, to uh, correctly uh, interact between the sound uh, parts. Uh, we have uh, the automation of such a parameters of the side chain as low pass, a high pass, high pass uh, and the other parameters of the, the other sound effects. We, use, uh, we also use uh, triggers at the side change. It's a special sound signals that is launched uh, together with uh, the sound design. The player won't hear it. It is a, a sinusoidal uh, signal. What's the advantage of this uh, trigger? It means uh, we can uh, tune the length of the trigger. It means uh, uh, how outstanding this, this particular sound design, the sound design of this particular object, which is a controlling signal. Something similar is being done by Tony Moderati from the US. He is a sound engineer from uh, US. When uh, sending the computer, it is working with the, uh, the frequencies, showing the frequencies first, and then removing the frequencies into the mix, and the, all the mix is uh, regarded as a set of the frequencies that should be shown first, but uh, then taken out. Uh, we have a similar approach, but uh, at the level of uh, sound design. Since we have a great number of the sound object, we should uh, focus the attention of the uh, gamers. Uh, the uh, player should uh, hear everything that uh, he sees on the screens. All the other sound objects uh, that are not visible are less uh, outstanding, they have less priority, they are vaguer, and uh, it is explained by uh, handling them and uh, processing them with low pass, uh, high pass, and uh, we have one of the modes is uh, uh, as if we're, uh, the player is uh, looking at the battlefield uh, through binoculars, uh, and uh, when uh, uh, the battlefield is ob observed uh, from, the dist from the range of 10 kilometers, uh, if uh, everything is uh, uh, seen and uh, reproduced, then it will uh, be a sound blur. So we should uh, limit some of the sound. Some of the sound engineers underestimate uh, the panorama, panorama of uh, the sound object. They think that uh, we would uh, bring in all the sounds and everything will be great. But that's not uh, true. At the phase of designing and uh, the phase when uh, thinking about uh, the composition and panorama, we should uh, define the position of the main gun and uh, the other sources of the sounds. To the left are camera guns uh, when we uh, see picture from the uh, camera of uh, the uh, main gun and uh, to the other it is the 
GPS uh, camera. As you can see, everything has uh, been designed uh, correctly and uh, it is uh, positioned uh, correctly on the panorama. As far as uh, the stereo base is concerned, many sound engineers uh, abuse uh, the following technique. They are trying to uh, achieve in uh, the solo regime uh, the sound design uh, real broad and uh, they make things uh, sounding broad, expansive. And uh, as a matter of fact, we have just broad mono instead of stereo. And uh, the good stereo effect is the difference between right and left channels. If we just uh, have uh, a pile of broad files, the difference uh, between the left and right channel would be minimum. So it would sound strange uh, for the uh, player. And uh, there's no point uh, making it that way. Next thing, talking about uh, the multi-background and multi-spatial mix. Mixing the uh, game, we build the gameplay based on the positioning. In other words, We set the game rules, and at a certain range, the sound should be attenuated, and uh, the prioritization is different. And we set physical parameters of our virtual world. Another thing, it's uh, handling multiple uh, spaces. We have. Uh, three messages to reverberator and uh, it uh, makes it uh, possible to imitate the delays uh, in the incoming sound. We have uh, separate sounds for close combat and uh, for combat and it uh, makes uh, the sound uh, track more logical, it is more natural. We have additional a layer of acoustic echo reflections and uh, they are placed on top, they are add-ons uh, on the uh, sound and it makes the gameplay more natural, more clear, crisp clear. Now I'd like to talk about mixing music. Music, uh, first of all, is a wide band object and the, the dynamic is uh, quite high. If we view it uh, separately, then uh, if uh, there, is, uh, there are other sound objects, then music is an obstruction and uh, vice versa. We have a special, how do we address this challenge? We have a special mix uh, with uh, music. We have a frequency balance, uh, which is optimal for music and we remove all the secondary sound the objects when the music is on. And those secondary are just coloristic. We cut them out because they won't be heard with the music on. Besides, we have a multi-band side chain on a musical bus. И у них главная э, энергия заключается именно в низкочастотном спектре. Соответственно, мы продавливаем именно этот низкочастотный спектр, не трогая все, что выше. Тем самым получаем более натуральный эффект. Далее, что касается уже, э, также мы должны прежде всего выравнивать э, все главные звуки по приоритизации и громкости. Что касается еще динамики в миксе, мы прежде всего, как в классическом микшировании, все это поджимаем на мастер-басе, собственно, мастер-компрессором, который выравнивает динамику и делает микс более слитным. И мастеринг уже представлен непосредственно обрезной фильтрацией, непосредственно саббаса и максимизацией и лимитированием, чтобы уже непосредственно аналога цифровой конвертер у, и цифро, наоборот, цифроаналоговый конвертер у игрока непосредственно не сходил с ума. Далее, переходя уже к творческому микшированию, которое рассматривает нестандартные действия, нестандартные решения, в принципе. Изначально я расскажу вам, что мы делали на примере Shell Tracker. Это такая специальная камера, которая 
предполагает собой слежение за снарядом и полет как бы на снаряде. Прежде всего, основная концепция была в том, чтобы сделать некий вуш, который бы перерастал потом в хит по кораблю. То есть должно быть что Но мы на создании, на... Непосредственно на момент создания этого эффекта не знали вот это расстояние между врагом, куда попадет наш снаряд, и непосредственно кораблем. We didn't know initially the distance and what should be the way out, and I've come to the conclusion, and uh, it is uh, I've just recalled Tony Shepard. It is a number of the sinusoidal signals, uh, and it is uh, perceived uh, as uh, uh, as uh, this way. That's how it sounds. And you can uh, you can have an illusion that uh, it is uh, the frequency is on the getting higher, but it's only an illusion. So, I've been thinking uh, how to deal with that because uh, per unit of uh, uh, time, the sound design should uh, stop and it should progress into the hit. So, what did I do? I've uh, got a chain of uh, and had them in the loop. Then there's another one, and still another one. Consequently, we repeat it over and over again, but uh, in the sound design. And that's how it looks in the gameplay. And uh, we make our gameplay more picturesque. So switching over to the next, to my next slide. So how did we address uh, the problem of the sound of the aircraft engines? Aircraft uh, engines. Uh, is uh, a sound cliche and uh, so many everyone knows uh, that particular sound and I've been thinking how to implement it I have subdiv I subdivide the sound into three phases first uh, we hear a booming sound from far away then we have a closer aircraft and uh, we hear a direct signal from the engine as well as uh, echoes of the reflected signals and the direct and uh, reflected sound is uh, interacting or interacting and uh, then when the air aircraft is uh, Overhead, we just uh, hear the uh, direct uh, signal, and uh, I had uh, to reproduce it, the Doppler effect and uh, the floating phase interference, and uh, that's how it sounds. So here it is from far away. The phase is the second phase is on. So the Doppler effect is reproduced. And then it is progressing into humming. So we are reproducing the real physical processes in the logic, and it affects the ambience of the sound. Every player knows those sounds, and uh, that's what the player would like to hear. The very last slide I would like to show you. 
is the implementation of the sound delay in the gameplay. It is uh, realized uh, th at uh, ultra high setting, and when the task was uh, to to prototype it, because uh, uh, the players uh, have been asking for it, and they said, "Okay, yes, please uh, give it to us." Then I used to think. We hear the sounds of the real combat at the range of 10 kilometers. Then I made a calculation. What will be the delay at uh, 10 kilometers? And it turned out that the delay is virtually 30 seconds, uh, 30 seconds. And it cannot be implemented at the gameplay because uh, the sound uh, part and the picture are se separate. And uh, so we needed a different approach, how to do it. And uh, I've uh, decided to appeal to the sound experience of the players. All of us uh, have uh, observed uh, a salu salvo of uh, the fireworks. At first, uh, there's a boom of the gunshot, uh, and then we see things, and uh, we get the feeling of the space. And since in the game plane, we build a perfect space, and uh, the perfect uh, behavior of uh, the uh, real world, uh, of the virtual world, uh, I have introduced uh, that kind of delay, which is a color colorification, but uh, it is not a, a reproduction of the physical processes in the acoustics. That, that's how it looks. There is a delay but uh, there's no separation from the picture. And if you analyze uh, the cinematography, obviously there's virtually no delay because uh, uh, we lose the separation of the picture of uh, the video and the sound. That's something that uh, we should not do. So. All I've uh, talked about is uh, our major concept that uh, we have uh, fine-tuned uh, when uh, doing the sound design and mixing our gameplay. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them right away. Thank you, Vladimir. Questions? Good morning. I'm Alexander. Two questions. One. You have an internal mixer, and uh, all those uh, objects will, could be reproduced in the mixer. And could uh, you uh, work it as if those were, were combat uh, drums? It's a new quirk that is being used now. Another one, we can do that. I would like uh, to get uh, the sounds of the warship and packing, unpacking. You mean voiceover? Yes, yes, uh, to record the, the sounds that are heard uh, over there. Yes, Captain. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. We are doing that, and uh, we are developing a modification. And in the next uh, couple of months, we will have a special applic application. You can uh, download it, and everything will be intuitive, user-friendly. OK, thank you. And uh, you have the top, the state-of-the-art uh, sounds in the gaming industry. Thank you. I'm Grigory Sichov. I am the historical consultant of the war gaming. What uh, real warship uh, sounds uh, have you been recording and used in the game play? Or, and did it happen, really or not? The warships are quite old that does not exist in reality. And it is, we, we cannot do what uh, the world of tanks can do. They can uh, get to the site and uh, record uh, the sounds of the engines. So it's uh, 
very large uh, machine and uh, how, uh, how could the, the there are three states uh, it is uh, the different positions of the cameras but the sounds uh, can be in the hold the sound of the from the deck the sound from the bridge and all those sounds are different and so we have uh, quite a lot of the sounds and uh, talking about what we have are coloristic sounds uh, like cracking of the ship hull and the ship bell sound and it is the coloristic uh, sounds uh, that uh, does not uh, require like uh, renting large warships uh, that are not in existence anymore so that that's how it is okay any other questions okay we have a hands uh, raised i watched uh, a number of the videos developing the sounds uh, from minsk minsk team was doing that and and uh, I paid attention that uh, the sound team is guided uh, by the feedback of the users. Uh, they read it, they make transformations, and uh, it is included. And does that happen that the feedback of the users uh, contradicts uh, to your perception of how, of how it should be? And uh, what do you do in such a situation? Very good question. Of course, we are monitoring the feedback. And if you have a new sound feature, uh, and uh, we try to track whether the users are happy because uh, our goal is to make the users uh, happy because otherwise uh, uh, the game would lose the momentum and we want uh, the players using it and so we are responding to the feedback. Sometimes uh, there is a controversy. We might uh, think that's how it should be but uh, the players uh, do not uh, like it but uh, anyway we are monitoring the situation, we are responding to them, and uh, we, uh, when using the uh, patches, we try to fix uh, things and uh, make the usability better. Okay, thanks, uh, Vladimir, for your very nice uh, presentation. If uh, there are still anybody willing to ask uh, questions, uh, they can do that on the face-to-face -face basis. Thank you.
So we keep catching our speakers in the hallway and putting cameras in front of them. Hi, please introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Samuel Rantaskla. I work for Microsoft as a principal program manager out of Sweden. OK, Samuel, so let's talk about games. What's your favorite game? Well, I wish I played a lot more games than I actually do. So I have to go back into the past. Like, one of my really favorite games is Jag the Lions 2 from like 92, 93. I think it was made here in Russia, if I'm not mistaken. Civilization, always been a big fan of that. And then the Enemy Unknown UFO trilogy from the 90s. There's so many games, I mean, it's like impossible to select one. But they're all strategic games, the ones that are my favorite. Yeah, you're obviously a tactician. That's commendable. But do you remember the very first game you've ever played? Uh, Decathlon, probably on the x86, somewhere around 84. Wow, that's... Uh, I don't even remember that one. Um, oh, it's like a, you basically play uh, Decathlon and you just hammer at the keyboard to go faster, like 10, 10 different sports events. Played it like crazy. I was eight years old then. <laughs> wow. Uh, how did you get in the, uh, into the gaming industry? It was by chance, actually. So I was studying at Uppsala University doing uh, computer science. And they had this fair uh, where companies were meeting the students. And there was these two guys that they've started a game company in the basement. And they wanted somebody to write a BSP tree, binary space partitioning tree. And I was looking for my thesis, so I figured, let's combine those. So I joined them, I wrote my thesis uh, in the games industry, and then from there on, kind of like, just went on. So this was 2000. Uh, but now in 2017, what's your favorite and least favorite thing about game dev? I mean, I think the games industry is awesome. Great place to work, there's so much passion, um, there's skilled, very intelligent people. Uh, I think. That's my favorite thing. Uh, the least favorite thing is that, which I covered in my speech a little bit, I think that we're looking a little bit too much at how do we turn time into money, uh, rather than seeing like how do, we, how do we educate our kids. I really wanna, that's my passion myself, is like take this experience, make our kids better today, tomorrow than they are today. I'm a parent as well, so that's coming from that. Well, that's a very noble thing to do. I don't know if noble, just I think it would be a good thing for us. Definitely. Is. Um, about your speech, did you have any interesting questions that maybe stood out? Yeah, there was some uh, interesting questions, like if we look at mixed reality, what's going to happen with that? Where, where, what's the dangers with that? I couldn't really answer them because it's, let's see what happens. But if you were a part of your own audience, what question would you like to ask yourself? Hmm, that was a tricky one. Um, are you sure that you're right? Are you? No. Well, we can be sure 100%, but still, we're trying to foresee the future here. How do you like the conference? Love it. St. Petersburg, great place. Wargaming, excellent hosts. It's a great place to be. You should come to the next one. Definitely do. Uh, say, if you had the chance to go back in time, uh, to when you just started working in the industry and give yourself one advice, what would it be? Try one of your ideas out. That's very good. Thank you very much, Samuel. Uh, I hope you like the conference. Thank you. We got another one of our speakers uh, here at 4C and uh, would like to ask him some questions. Hi, uh, please introduce yourself. 
Hey, my name is Eric and I'm the CEO of the Do Dreams Game Studio based in Helsinki, Finland. Very nice to meet you, Eric. Uh, tell me, what's the very first video game you've ever played? Uh, I guess when I was a little kid, my dad was in banking and he had a lot of business trips and he went to Japan and he brought me one of these Nintendo uh, handheld like small small games. It probably was Donkey Kong. So that's my first memories with gaming and then I played a lot of Oil Panic with the Disney characters, so fond memories with those. Uh, favorite uh, gaming memories? Well, I like games that I can play with my friends. I remember when I was in high school, we'd go visit my friend's house and we played a lot of these uh, like sports games together, like uh, NHL 95 and some F1 racing games. So I would say that maybe NHL 95 is, is the game that I have played most with my friends and I have fond memories of you know starting after school and then realizing this like 2 a.m. and uh, knowing that my mother will be very angry when I come home late. <laughs> that happened to all of us, I think. Uh, how did you start in the video game industry? What led you here? Uh, I was earlier a marketing uh, lecturer at this business school in Helsinki. And then at some point I realized that instead of talking about business, that I'd like to do business, business myself. Uh, I had my own startup for three years. Uh, did uh, different kinds of entertainment apps. I was interested in storytelling and apps and online and social media. Uh, after that, uh, I, I, I did that for three years, failed miserably. But I guess the one thing I learned was to how to test concepts early with real customer data. Because when you have little money, you need to be sure that you're, you're spending it wisely. And um, I had the opportunity to join an existing team. So I joined Do Dreams as a CEO. And uh, together with the wonderful team I have there, we, we, we uh, started with these mini games, eventually came up with Drive Ahead, which is our current franchise that we're developing. Sounds great. Uh, tell me what... Like, or like, oh, okay. yeah. 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 Yes, yeah, okay, okay, yeah. Uh, so, what's uh, your favorite thing about uh, the video gaming industry, or maybe just something you strongly like about it? I think the, my favorite thing about the gaming industry is the community of developers. So, uh, traveling around the world, meeting wonderful people who make games, and, and you know, talking to people and learning from them. I think it's really cool how in gaming people are very open to share their experiences. Uh, about you know the business aspect of running a game studio management stuff uh, you know tips and advice on on scaling and growing a company it has been very useful for me and and hopefully by giving talks at events like this maybe I can give something back to the to the community oh you definitely are uh, anything that maybe irritates you or something you don't like about the industry strongly dislike well uh, I think in recent years like uh, you know, games are developed with data and analytics, and that's of course very important. And I think all decisions, all the creative decisions, should be based on on data. But what I've noticed noticed is that um, studios maybe give up quite easily on games and and their communities. So we have found that that uh, if we really invest in the community and take care of the players by making regular updates to the game, thinking the game of the game not as a product but as a service, then the community will support you through difficult times. Uh, what trends do you think are going to persist or maybe appear anew uh, in like a 10 years time? Let's make a prediction. Oh, that's, uh, that's a very tricky question. So with uh, everything developing so fast, I guess it's really difficult to say. Um, I'm very excited about AR. So our studio, we launched our first augmented reality game, Drive Ahead Mini, Mini Golf, just yesterday. So I'm very interested in seeing how this market will develop in the next uh, year or two. If you look at 10-year 10, 10 perspective, then maybe games will be everywhere. Maybe like your glasses could be a, a, a platform for playing games. I'd love that. Yeah, yeah, so maybe, you know, like, uh, it will be very interesting to see what kind of sessioning games will have when people could basically be playing all the time. 
Uh, what do you think uh, is uh, more important uh, in a game, like one of its aspects, uh, the ever-discussed questions, the graphics, the gameplay, the game design, uh, the storytelling maybe? Um, we usually start with a fun core gameplay. So, of course, we want to make fun, cool games. But we found that that's not enough. So you need to make sure that uh, your players have a reason to return to the game often and they want to return with their friends. So I think planning this progression and making sure that there are some kind of events like live operations, I think that's very important. And though everybody knows monetization is important, like just thinking of the, the path the player takes in the game and when, when are they presented with opportunities to spend money or watch videos or do something like that, like connecting the revenue model with making the game experience better. I think that's, that's very crucial. Uh, do you have a vision of a video game you'd like to create if you weren't restricted in absolutely no way, like financially, creatively? There's only one right answer to this, and that is that if we would have no financial restrictions, we would be doing the exact same thing that we're doing now. So I believe that the format that we have developing games with minimum risk and investment, testing concepts early with players, and, and launching games thanks to this wonderful large and active community that we have with, uh, with Drive Ahead is the way that we would want to do it you know, regardless of what kind of budget we have. Sounds fair. Uh, let's come back to the real world for a moment. What do you think about St. Petersburg? St. Petersburg is a wonderful place. We've been blessed by wonderful weather this time. Uh, I heard from the locals that we're very lucky to enjoy this nice weather. Uh, I've had the opportunity to visit St. Petersburg uh, three times during the last year for a couple of events. And I'm always excited to meet the local developers. Uh, our drive-ahead game uh, on Android Russia is the largest market for us and, and this is something that we're, we want to understand better, like why people like the game here and, and, and see how we as a studio could be more present in Russia and, and be closer to our flat fans, the players on, on Russian social media. So that's why I'm always interested to, to visit Russia and meet people if I have the chance. Well, now you have the chance, another one. Um, at this. Uh uh, event for C, and what do you think about it? Uh, I've had a chance to talk at many international events in China and the US GDC and places in Europe. I think uh, 4C is the best organized event I've ever been to. You, know, you guys are taking really good care of the guests and, and the lineup is awesome. So uh, I'm giving a talk myself, but uh, the rest of the time I have a full schedule of listening to presentations. So usually when you go, I go to these international conferences I'm quite tied up with meeting partners, but here I'm really going to enjoy going to the talks myself and hearing what the experiences people share. Uh, and if you were interviewing yourself right now, what question would you like to ask yourself? <laughs> what question would I like to ask myself? I'd probably ask that why do I have this wonderful beard? Why do you? Well, I'll tell you guys a secret. So I'm actually the great, great grandson of Santa Claus. And that's why I have this beard. And, and Santa Claus said to me that you have to learn how to bring people of the world joy. So that's why for the next about 200 years, I'm going to be the CEO of the Do Dreams Game Studio. And one day in about 200 years, when my beard is all white, then I will become the next Santa Claus really looking forward to it and from the presence from you. Uh, what are you looking forward to? What's uh, maybe the speech that you'd like to hear most? Anything specific? I love all these like demos and, and case studies that people do. I, I, I really like the, the talks where, where people go through some project and, and, and go through their experiences. So, so I'm, I have several of those in my schedule. Great. Sounds exciting. And now children all, all over the world are excited for a new Santa. And uh, I hope you have a good time here. Thank you. Thank you.